Welcome to our live cast, webcast popular joint and bursa injections using ultrasound. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heidi Border and I'm senior meeting planner for Azure Pain Medicine and will be the host for tonight's webinar. We are joined tonight by our moderator, Dr. Dennis Patterson of the Nevada Advanced Pain Specialists in Reno, Nevada, who is going to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Welcome, Dr. Patterson. Hey, thank you uh, for having us tonight and uh, look forward uh, to tonight's presentation and, and having my friend uh, and colleague, Dr. David Russo, help out. Great to be here, Dennis. Thanks. Um, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up our slides here and we can get started going through the presentation. Um, so as Heidi was saying here, our um, um, uh, Dave, Dave and I in the flesh. Um, I'm currently in Reno, Nevada, and uh, Dave is currently up in Hood River, Oregon. Um, uh, we both kind of run our own uh, different pain management clinics. I mean, we, we both do the same thing um, and have been friends and colleagues, Dave, for a, a very long time. Uh, Dave and I met actually interviewing for residency to do a physical medicine rehabilitation residency program at the University of Washington and ended up doing our um, PM&R um, residency at the Mayo Clinic together. So Dave and I have known each other for a very long time and I always give Dave credit. I wouldn't be doing pain management if it wasn't for Dr. Russo. Uh, Dave convinced me to do um, a pain fellowship when I was dead set on being a sports medicine uh, physician. So Dave, thanks for, for leading the way. Um, so, um, since graduating, Dave and I both have gotten board certifications in physical medicine rehabilitation um, and uh, pain medicine. Uh, I think we both just did a recertification a couple of years ago. Um, in 2009, I started my clinic, uh, Nevada Advanced Pain Specialists. Our clinic has grown leaps and bounds. We now have three different clinics, one in Sparks, Reno, and Carson, uh, uh, City, Nevada. Um, on two different occasions, I've been voted one of the top 25 doctors in Northern Nevada. And actually, during the middle of the pandemic in 2021, I, I got um, voted the 2021 Innovator of the Year. So it's kind of been uh, quite a ride. Dr. Russo, I think immediately upon graduating, took over control of Columbia Pain um, uh, uh, Medicine uh, uh, Pain Clinic. He's been running that clinic now for 15 years up in Hood River and in, in is a uh, well astute a physician in uh, regenerative medicine. Um, and actually that's why um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Dave will talk about it tonight that being accurate with your joint bursa or even peripheral nerve injections when you're doing regenerative medicine is essential so that the patient gets the best result possible. Okay. Here's Dave's and I's uh, disclosures. And then our contact information, um, we are both open to you reaching out to us at any point after the presentation, if you have any questions. I do encourage you tonight that we do have a Q&A uh, section. Please write in any questions you may have. Um, uh, we'll try to answer them during the presentation. If not, um, we will get to them hopefully at, at the very end during our live segment. And we're gonna start it off with having Dr. Russo go through um, um, actually the, the basics of ultrasound. Fantastic. Okay. So Dennis, you're in charge of the up and down keys and, um, we'll kind of go through this. <clears throat> we'll kind of go through these introductory slides together. I think most of the participants probably already have a pretty solid sort of understanding of, of the physics of ultrasound, but just to kind of review on a high level. So basically what this modality involves, this diagnostic and image, imaging modality involves is directing sound waves through the body and um, analyzing the reflections back to the probe in order to generate an image. And high frequency sound uh, is used uh, to, 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 to get that image and we measure the frequency in cycles per second. So we're dealing with high frequency ultrasound waves that are that that are not audible uh, to to the human ear. So it's a very um, it's 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 a very safe and accessible uh, diagnostic modality that can be done at the 
at the point of care and at the bedside and, and certainly, you know, seeing it in a number of specialties ranging from uh, orthopedics to pain medicine to uh, ER. So it's really sort of becoming the next uh, sort of modern stethoscope of our time for a number of specialties. So next slide. Um, so the big idea here is that directing directing sound waves, you know, in into the body frequency matters. So higher frequencies penetrate uh, deeper than than lower frequencies. And again, what you're seeing come back to the probe. The probe is both emitting the sound signal and sensing the reflection of the sound waves. So um, the real business part of any ultrasound system is in the probe. Um, most of the manufacturers have really gotten the electronics of the um, image processing piece of the equipment down to a very fine science, but you really want to ask about the frequency of the probes, their durability, uh, the kind of arrays, the piezoelectrodes, because that's really going to be the, the piece of the equipment that's responsible for, for generating the best image quality. So things that appear bright on the ultrasound image are things that are reflecting sound waves back to the probe. Things that appear darker on the ultrasound image are uh, have more water content, and that represents uh, sound waves being transmitted through the through the tissues. So next slide. Uh, again, this kind of uh, summarizes what I said previously. These piezoelectric crystals uh, are both sort of the emitting and sensing uh, component of the system. The amount of energy uh, reflected equals the density of what you're looking at. So uh, uh, echolucent or hypoechoic uh, substances or tissues uh, contain uh, water and uh, are, are, are more transmissible of sound and substances that are denser or brighter, such as uh, bone, reflect most of those sound waves back. So they appear uh, bright on, on the screen. Something to keep in mind is that, you know, the ultrasound probe gets the best signal reflected back to it when it's perpendicular to the area of interest. So this gets into a concept called anisotropy, or sometimes you can affect the appearance of things on the screen by not being directly over them or perpendicular to the image that you're, the uh, location that you're imaging. Next slide. Image, uh, image resolution is, is key, especially when you're sort of uh, directing uh, your treatment to um, uh, deeper structures or, or nerves or areas where there's a lot of vascularity, a lot of overlapping uh, kinds of tissues. And color Doppler really becomes essential, uh, especially when you're doing work around nerves, maybe hydrodissection around the brachial plexus or the carpal tunnel or other common areas of nerve entrapment. You really want to have that color Doppler feature available so you can differentiate um, you know, uh, vessels from, from other structures that you're trying to treat. Next slide. Um, this kind of re this re reiterates the concept that low frequency probes are uh, thought of, are, are more scanning probes. They send uh, sound signals deeper into the tissues and are, are great for visualizing abdominal organs. Uh, and, and deeper stru structures. Scanning superficial probes or, ho or high, um, high frequency probes are good for imaging nervous uh, uh, nerves and uh, tendon ligaments that are closer to the, that are closer to the skin. Probes can come in various formats. So you'll hear about sort of a long linear format, short linear format, or hockey stick transducer kind of format, small parts formats. All of these are just different. Um, configurations of, of, of the piezoelectric crystals inside the probe. So, you know, again, the probe is really the business part of the system. Next slide. Lower frequency probes uh, are, are great for analyzing deep, uh, deep abdominal structures. Next slide. Superficial structures. This would be an example of a um, short platform linear array, high frequency transducer. So again, this is gonna be very good for looking at um, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and relatively more superficial musculoskeletal structures. Next slide. 
a little bit about scanning technique. So um, unlike other diagnostic modalities that, um, that we might use, ultrasound is very much operator dependent. So um, you have to really be thoughtful about the patient positioning. Many of the procedures and injections we do sort of mimic the setups that we would use for anatomically guided uh, procedures. But sometimes you do have to take into consideration sort of the ergonomics of the space that you're working in and um, attention to sterile, um, sterile setup and, and, and sterile technique. This becomes especially important if you're, if you're considering incorporating any regenerative therapy injections into your practice, which all involve uh, blood products. So um, usually what we look at is um, sterile gel, um, and a, a sheet over over the probe, and sometimes a long um, uh, a, a long sheath, kind of uh, protecting the ultrasound probe and uh, and cord. Next slide. A little bit about knobology. So, if you look at old ultrasound machines, or maybe some of the ultrasound machines you see in the diagnostic imaging department at your hospital you'll notice there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of different sliders and knobs. Uh, these are all sort of um, there to kind of help with calibration of the ultrasound signal. Many of the newer machines that are sort of designed to be more for point of care or bedside use kind of um, use kind of pre-programmed or preset uh, functions or kind of software running in running in the background, but really what you're trying to do is fine tune the, uh, the, the, the depth of the ultrasound down into that focal range where, where, where you're scanning the structure of interest. So what you're trying to do is overcome the phenomenon of attenuation, which is as ultrasound waves get, um, get propagated through the tissues, they become smaller as they penetrate the tissue. So that's overcome by adjusting the gain and the newer machines um, have built into them algorithms based upon uh, various depths of tissues or various kinds of uh, anatomical structures you're looking at so that this time gain compensation feature uh, sort of you know happens in 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 the background so it's it's wonderful software to really facilitate the ease of scanning patients and uh, performing injections but also important to understand sort of the underlying physics in the background that are being optimized to generate the image. Next slide. A little bit about some terminology that ultrasound that ultrasonographers will use in the space of diagnostic imaging. Of course, we're very familiar with axial and transverse um, uh, images to a structure. In, in ultrasonography, we also, um, look at a lot of structures sort of in their anatomical plane, which may not be the same as the plane of the person. So a lot of structures are, are at oblique angles to things that we're interested in. So, you know, you'll often hear um, people who do a lot of ultrasound guided procedures talk about being, you know, long to X, Y, and Z, looking at a structure in its long axis or its short axis uh, versus looking at it in its anatomical plane. So just a little bit of a um, kind of clarification of those concepts. Next slide. So, um, you know, an, uh, an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, as they say. So things that you can do to kind of help facilitate your, your sort of development of proficiency in, in this operator dependent um, modality is, is to learn to be ambidextrous to the extent that you can. It is very helpful to uh, sort of scan, you know, to have a scanning hand and an injecting hand and then uh, being able to, to switch between the two. That's, that's very helpful instead of having to reconfigure your room or go to the other side of the patient. Um, keeping contact with the patient. So oftentimes when I see people who are new to doing these sorts of uh, injections or new to the use of ultrasound, they're, they're holding the ultrasound probe higher up near its attachment to the cord. That's a um, very flippy floppy way to hold the cord, to hold the probe, if you will. So really sort of coming down and having your, your contact at the base of the pro or at, at, at the tip of the probe and, and contacting with the patient is the best way to kind of keep control um, of, of, of the situation and, and perform the injection 
uh, as safely as possible. Also taking a moment to visualize the structures of interest and the structures around the area that you're trying to treat, that goes a long way. Not everyone has read the same Netter Anatomy book that we all studied and you do see plenty of plenty of anatomical variations, especially in the musculoskeletal realm. And then there are a number of good phantoms that are available on the market. And those are, those are fun and useful to practice with to kind of, again, develop that eye-hand coordination and that facility with switching between hands. So Dennis, do you wanna talk to us about, uh, oh, some tips, uh, just, a, just a, a, a little sort of tip here before I sort of hand this back to Dennis is kind of the concept of jiggle. So um, as you're kind of, you know, um, uh, learning to do these injections, sometimes it's helpful to sort of introduce a little bit of back and forth movement into the, in, into the, uh, uh, the needle to improve its, its, its visibility. So Dennis here is showing us, you know, uh, a needle coming down into a structure and there's a little bit of kind of back and forth movement or jiggle to kind of help kind of draw your eye to the area where you're trying to inject. And uh, with that, I'll let Dennis take us through the next, the next set of slides. Yeah, so um, let me move the slides forward. So, um, so as Dave was talking about, he's talking about different um, text and we, or about the ultrasound machine. And I think being able to optimize and get your ultrasound machine to give you the best resolution possible for, of not only one, the patient structures, but to your target allows you to um, uh, end up getting the best results while injecting the patient. But if you look at here, there's a couple of different reasons why you can have failure, you know. Um, uh, number one, you know, if you're coming in plane and your needle gets out from underneath the ultrasound. So if you look here, you've got an injection bottom left where you, you've got an anatomical structure that's oblique. You've got your probe along the top of it. You're coming out of plane with your injection needle. Where you're gonna see the needles where it's only underneath the probe, right? So the needle tip is passed. And so you're not gonna see that. And, and so you can miss where you're injecting. So you always wanna, if you're gonna come out of plane, you're gonna to wanna to come you know, next to it, get the needle tip right underneath the probe. If you're coming in plane, it would be on the either edge of the uh, ultrasound probe. You're gonna to wanna to go along the probe and make sure your needle tip doesn't veer off to the right or the left so that you're always in plane um, with, your, uh, with your probe or the needle's always in plane with your probe. <clears throat> and that brings us to needles where I think can also bring uh, another huge advantage. So not only getting better at um, maximizing your ultrasound machine, but the equipment or the you know that you use can also increase your visibility uh, of, of your needle. And so there's a couple different choices that you're going to make with your needle. First one's going to be, you know, what, what size needle are you going to use? Are you going to use a 22 gauge? Or are you going to use a 25 gauge? Um, there's a couple of uh, advantages uh, and disadvantages to these. One, a 25 gauge needle may hurt less for our patient, but it's going to be quite a bit floppier. So it may catch uh, tissues and kind of uh, bend a little bit. Um, it may be harder to keep in plane. A 22 gauge needle may hurt a little bit more for the patient because it's a little bit thicker, uh, but it's not going to bend as much and it, it, it'll be easier to keep more in plane while doing your injections. Two, you can have blunt ended needles. So those usually uh, hurt a little bit more when, when, when poking the patient. Sharper ones um, uh, are, are less painful, but you know the, the advantage of the, um, the dull needle is that you're not gonna hurt any vital structures if you poke them. Um, with a sharp needle, you could do more harm than good if you, if you do poke a nerve or, or any other vital structure uh, or vascular structure specifically. Um, and then the other thing that I want to highlight is that your needle, the, the surface of the needle, it, it, do you go for a hypochoic needle, which means that it's harder to see, or do you go with a hyperechoic needle? And that's what we're trying to show here on the left um, is a hyperechoic needle that under your ultrasound, uh, it, it, it uh, will reflect the beam back to the probe and pick up a, a better signal. Um, and that's what Payunk is, is trying to do. So um, They've got two different types of needles. They got a Sono MSK and a Sono Flex. The Sono MSK is more for muscle skeletal injections. Dave and I are going to be highlighting that. The Sono Flex is going to be more for your peripheral nerve 
injections and, and basically you can stimulate the nerve. So you can get the needle in place um, and then you can use um, um, stimulation to stimulate the nerve to make sure that you've got adequate placement. Now, these, these corner cornerstone reflectors, um, what they're essentially doing on the, the covering of this, of this needle is that they're maximizing the amount of waves that return to the ultrasound so that the needle shows up better. And the great part about these are they're at different angles. So it doesn't matter um, what angle your needle is at. So if we look here below, we see a needle that's at, you know, which would usually normally with a hypo or coag needle give you your best um, image is because the, as the ultrasound waves come down, they're gonna come back and it's, it's gonna hit um, uh, almost you know, perpendicular to it because you're almost going parallel with the, uh, uh, the surface of the transducer. But usually when you get steeper, so here you're probably at a 45 degree angle and on the right one, you're probably at a 70 or 80 degree angle. Usually those beams would come down, hit and, and miss the ultrasound because they get reflected at that angle which it, instead of going back up um, 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 perpendicular to, to the probe. And so the, these cornerstone reflectors being set on the surface of the needle at different angles allows that to be reflected back that perpendicularly to the transducer to show up. And so you can see that it doesn't matter what angle you're at, you can still see um, uh, your, your needle. So the biggest things that I just wanna give you the key takeaways about these needles is that they um, uh, uh, allow you to see your needle, which means um, you can be quicker with doing the procedure. You can be safer because you know where your needle tip is gonna be at at all times and you're not gonna hit a neurovascular uh, structure. And they can also, you know, the procedure can be done at any angle, um, whether it's in plane or out of plane, you know, a 30 degree angle, or a 70 or 80 degree angle that, that you're still gonna get reflection of the needle back to the ultrasound probe. They're also gonna give you improved tactile uh, feedback. And at the end of the day, you're just looking to get the best outcome you can. So if you know where your needle tip hit the structure and, and the injection was done properly, that's gonna give you the best results. Plus it's gonna give you that safety that you know you're not gonna cause your patient uh, any, any harm at all uh, during the procedure. And that kind of brings us, um, you know, previously I, I've done a uh, ultrasound and MSK uh, presentation with our colleague, Dr. Rosenblum. Um, he also goes in a little bit more detail with the basics of ultrasound. So if you're interested in the topic of ultrasound and want to learn more, I'd encourage you to go to Payum's um, uh, YouTube page. Uh, they have a lot of different videos showing a lot of different procedures, and it even includes mine and Dr. Rosenblum's pre previous presentation, which talks about um, other, uh, other injections that aren't going to be presented tonight, plus more in detail regarding ultrasound um, uh, principles and best practices. Which now brings us to our main topic tonight, uh, um, injections um, uh, in, the, in the pain clinic. And when I was asked to do this presentation, I just went back through three months of my clinic to find what the most common joint and bursa injections that I did under ultrasound. What I found is that there are glenohumeral joint injections, subacromial bursa injections, and intraarticular hip injections. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Dave's going to go over the shoulder, uh, the two shoulder injections, and then I'm going to retake over and talk about uh, the hip injections. Um, but I always just want to remind people that before we talk about the injections, you know, why are we doing or how do we select which procedure is correct to do? And, you know, when I talk to residents at the University of Nevada, Reno, we always talk about how probably the most important thing is talking to your patients. You know, the, the mystery is in the history. If you can talk to a patient and know the right questions to ask, you probably already know what's going on with them before you lay a finger on them. The second thing is the physical exam. The physical exam is crucial because now that should confirm what I'm thinking based off of the history that I got out of the patient. And then the third thing I look for is just the icing on the cake. And that is imaging to confirm um, what I believe by their history and physical examination. Um, I, you know, I tell patients all the time, I try not to look at the imaging until I've gotten their history and done their physical exam because I don't want the imaging to bias my opinion. I think we all know that uh, you know, there's been at least four or five clinical studies over the last 20 years showing that imaging um, on patients with no pain shows abnormalities in like 80% of patients. 
And so we would never treat an abnormal image where a patient has no pain. And so we need to make sure that the imaging finding correlates with the history and the physical examination. And Dave and I are physiatrists, so uh, I believe in EMG studies if we're looking for neurological disorders, especially with peripheral nerves, EMGs can pick up if there's a, a radiculopathy, plexopathy, mononeuropathy, and it even can tell you if there's um, certain muscle diseases and or neuromuscular junction disorders. And then overall, you know, you're going to take the whole thing, the history of the physical examination, the imaging studies, and an EMG study at home, and, and get your best clinical impression to dictate what procedure you do. And then when you're doing the procedures, you're doing them for several reasons. One, you want them to be diagnostic. So if you block the proper structure, the pain goes away, uh, then you know that that's the, the source of the patient's pain. If you... Uh, uh, and, and if you, if it is diagnostic, then overall you're hoping to decrease the patient's pain, improve their function. I think we've all realized that pain scores aren't the end all be all. Being able to get our patients back to doing their normal activities of daily living and getting back to life is is vital. And if you can in, uh, decrease their pain, improve their function overall, you're going to improve their their quality of life. At that point, I'm going to turn it back over to Dave. Um, to talk to us about the, the shoulder injections. Okay, so let's talk about the glenohumeral joint injection. And I would just echo what, um, what Dennis said about, you know, in any, in any pain clinic or any musculoskeletal oriented clinic, you know, shoulder, uh, neck and low back pain are going to be the, among the two most commonest, common things you see. And about one third of the time, what comes to you as a, as, as a neck pain complaint is really a shoulder complaint. And about one third of the time, what comes to you as a lumbar spine complaint or a low back pain complaint is really a hip, uh, a, a hip or pelvis issue. So, having good working understanding of the kind of somatic and musculoskeletal kind of mimickers of things like cervical and lumbosacral radiculopathy really goes a long way. So, just a brief review of the anatomy of the shoulder joint. So, um, the glenohumeral joint is a ball and socket joint. And it is actually the most mobile, among the most mobile joints in, in the body. And what that comes at is the expense of stability. So by being the most mobile joint in the body, it's also the most um, vulnerable to instability. And its function is, is, really, um, is, is really made possible through uh, its neuromuscular control. So the rotator cuff muscles and tendons that help keep you know, the, the, the ball on the socket, if you will, who helps keep the, the, um, the humerus kind of onto the, uh, the, the, the glenoid fossa. So um, the weakest part of the joint, of course, is, is, is the inferior portion. Um, uh, its movements, as, as, as we're all aware, is flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, lateral rotation, medial rotation, circumduction. And the reason why it's important to really take patients through both an active and passive range of motion of this particular joint is it's gonna really help you sort of refine your differential diagnosis of what structure it could be uh, the pain generator. Is this more of a labral type pain generator or a tendon type pain generator, or interarticular, extraarticular? So again, knowing how these tissues function in this joint is important for understanding uh, what the differential diagnosis of a, of, of a neck shoulder complaint could be. So next slide. So glenohumeral joints uh, injections are indicated when you think that the cause of the pain is coming from inside the joint. So what structures are inside the joint? There's the labrum, uh, there's the cartilage, um, and, and, you're, and, and, and you're, trying to, you're trying to direct your uh, diagnostic injection or, 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 or your therapeutic injection into the structures, in toward the interarticular structures. So physical examination may show um, a reduced passive range of motion. There may be clicking. There may be mechanical blocks to motion. There may be certain impingement maneuvers or certain kinds of positions uh, where, where, where the joint feels uh, unstable or the patient feels apprehensive. Those are all uh, clues that that um, that lead you to think about an interarticular glenohumeral joint injection. So next slide. 
uh, for an old, for uh, the probe you're going to use in most all cases, you're going to use a linear probe because you're going to want to differentiate between some of these structures like labrum, bone, and tendon. Uh, there are patients who have you know a, a significant thicker body habitus where even a really good high frequency linear probe can uh, doesn't penetrate as deeply as you uh, need to to see those to see those targets. But um, most of the time, a good high frequency linear probe will get you there. 22 gauge, three and a half inch needle is usually sufficient. And then if this is a diagnostic or therapeutic injection, you want some combination of a local anesthetic and uh, ropivacaine. Uh, if, it's a, if, if it's an orthobiologic injection, you may be looking at something like hyaluronic acid or platelet-rich plasma um, type solution as well. So next slide. This basically shows the setup. This shows that technique I was talking about, about having good hand control of the probe. So you have uh, the operator's hand, uh, both contacting the probe and contacting the patient. They're, they're down towards you know what I call the business end of the probe. They're able to stabilize their hand well on the patient. And they're kind of looking at that posterior kind of uh, aspect of the shoulder. So scanning probably superiorly and inferiorly to kind of find that, that ball and socket uh, um, or, 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 or that golf ball on a T appearance of the glenohumeral joint. So next slide. And I think what we're gonna see here is a demonstration of an out of plane approach to injecting that joint. And again, very useful to know both in plane and out of plane approaches. So let's, let's play this slide and, and, and look at this injection. So here we have a probe across the joint. You see that golf ball on a T type appearance, uh, local skin wheel, just to kind of help facilitate the comfort of the patient, identify the labrum, trying to avoid the labrum, but you want to see that little tip of the needle come down right in between that ball and socket. So we're gonna look for it, we can see it. So coming back and forth and kind of walking down into the joint, this is a great technique. So you're walking down into the joint. When you feel yourself engage the joint, you inject with your, with your injecting hand. Oftentimes you can actually visualize the injectate going down into that golf ball on a T type structure. And that is a very successful, well-performed out of plane uh, injection. So this is an example from my clinic this week of an in-plane injection. So here the joint looks a little different but on the left side, we see um, a standard 22 gauge quinky needle. We're gonna see we're, we're gonna see the needle come down through the skin and the overlying deltoid, and uh, kind of work its way down to that little um, kind of crevice appearing area down in the joint. So you see a little bit of tissue jiggle as I'm kind of making my way down into that glenohumeral joint. And we're gonna see the same injection done on the same patient using a more uh, uh, conspicuous needle like the Sono MSK. So here, same approach coming in under the probe in plane, you can see already that the needle is more easily visible. And again, I'm scanning back and forth just a little bit, kind of, you know, kind of comforting the patient as we kind of get the, Kind of get the injection going here we see a nice bright hypercoat needle coming down into that uh, crevice area where the injection will be performed and that is a long axis approach to the glenohumeral joint in plane in plane long axis approach to the joint okay next slide subacromial bursa injection so a subacromial bursa injection is injecting into what I like to think of as sort of the potential space between the joints and tendons of the shoulder. This is a very useful injection in older patients who may have significant uh, arthritis, osteophytic spurring. Um, they may have contractures or other uh, issues that make positioning difficult. So injecting into the subacromial bursa is a good way to indirectly target the joint. The bursa communicates with the joint, but it also communicates with other periarticular structures. So what you lose here is you lose diagnostic specificity with this injection. So this is 
uncommonly done on a diagnostic basis. This is more of a, 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 a kind of a um, more generalized approach to treating uh, kind of whole shoulder pathology. So we're injecting into the subacromial space right under the deltoid and right under the uh, acromium of the shoulder. So next slide. Indications here is like I described, it's more for a, a, a subacromial bursitis. So bursitis manifests itself when you have a joint, um, a joint that's producing a lot of synovium and, and that synovial fluid sort of needs a, a, a place to go. So oftentimes these bursas are kind of low pressure release valves for, for a joint that's got some interarticular pathology. There may be an impingement syndrome where the patient has pain with certain ranges of motion and that bursa is uh, getting irritated. A rotator cuff tendinopathy, you may be able to directly visualize uh, changes at the um, uh, tendon, tendon muscle or, or, or tendon bone interface. Physical examination is usually consistent for um, some kind of um, uh, some kind of impingement maneuver or pain with a specific kind of range of motion like uh, external rotation in the shoulder. So that's what we typically see. We see weakness or pain with internal rotation of the shoulder, uh, and and that's an indication for this injection. So let's take a look at the next slide. Here we're going to use a linear ultrasound probe. Same, uh, same cocktail of injectate, if you will, it's a combination of a local anesthetic, a, uh, a particulate steroid is fine for this injection. Uh, if you're using an, orth an orthobiologic, again, you'd be looking at something like a leukocyte poor platelet rich plasma uh, for, this kind of, for this kind of injection for a regenerative injection. Next slide. So here's the setup for a subacromial bursa injection. So what you want to appreciate here is that the uh, position of the probe is more anterolateral on the shoulder uh, as opposed to the, uh, the glenohumeral joint. So oftentimes what you do is you visualize the tip of the acromion. It's a big, bright, echogenic structure, very easy to find. Then you slide laterally kind of onto the deltoid region. And, and, and that's where you find, that's where you look for the potential space of the bursa that you'll see a, a, a hypoechoic line. So again, um, this is uh, just kind of showing that, that location of the acromium and the subacromial space. So next slide. Uh, same thing, same thing here. So here's an injection coming in. See a little uh, skin wheel and then uh, coming down into the joint and coming into the, in, into the bursal location. So going right under the, kind of going right up to the, the lip of the acromion. This is from my clinic. So these, these, are, these are slides I'm a little familiar with. So here on the left, we have a standard 22 gauge uh, um, needle. You're seeing that uh, you're seeing the tip of the acromion on the right side of the screen. You're gonna see the needle come left to right into that hypoechoic space right above the tendon. So you're gonna see some tissue jiggle as that needle kind of works its way down into that very thin hypoechoic space. Let's look at it with a more uh, conspicuous needle, the Soto MSK. So again, coming in, again, it's, it's automatically more easily visualized. I'm scanning back and forth a little bit. And again, you're able to see that needle and trace it all the way down into that thin hypoechoic area of the subacromial space. All right, Dennis, do you want to talk about the hip joint? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn take it over from here. And, and, and thanks. I was trying to highlight, can you guys see out there, uh, Dave? Can you verify for me when I use my mouse? Can you guys see when I'm highlighting the structures that you're talking about? No? Dennis, your mouse is working great. Oh, perfect. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm trying to highlight when you were saying the acromion tip and the space. I was trying to highlight it with my mouse. So thank you. Um, the, so yeah, I'm going to talk about the hip joint. Um, so obviously the, the two shoulder injections that Dave talked about, you know, there is a blind technique that can be done blind. Um, uh, and, and, you know, but from my perspective, you know, for not, not only for safety, 
but for the diagnostic purpose and to make sure I'm doing the right thing for a patient, I always want to do my my injections, as I was saying, under some image guidance. And and so, you know, with the hip, there there is no blind technique, and that's just because of the neurovascular structures in the area. You do not want to hit the femoral artery um, or the femoral nerve when performing this procedure. And so you can typically do this either under ultrasound or fluoroscopy. And ultrasound is much more portable, much easier to use uh, versus um, uh, doing this procedure under fluoroscopy, which usually, um, uh, you know, you're, you're limited in your time with the fluoroscopy unit, either in your office or at a surgery center. Um, so obviously we, we've got the, the, the hip joint, which consists of the acetabulum, the femoral head, the femoral neck, and then you get the intertrochanic line. Um, and, and the great part about the hip joint is it's basically a big balloon. And all you got to do is get your needle inside the balloon. The actual balloon goes from the uh, acetabulum all the way down to the intertrochanteric line. So for me, um, I don't concentrate on getting it into the, the joint space per se. I'm just getting it inside the joint. And so my technique is to go down and touch on the femoral neck and inject because I know I'm um, um, inside the balloon or inside the, the hip joint and, and the medication will then diffuse and get to where it needs to be. Uh, main uh, things that you're going to do in intraarticular hip injection are for um, either a, a, a internal derangement or osteoarthritis. Internal derangements can be, you know, a, a, a labral tear, um, femoral acetabular syndrome. I think we all know those are usually in younger patients where they have a, a mismatch between the shape of the acetabulum or the head of the, uh, the femur. They're usually going to notice pain with extreme uh, uh, flexion past 90 degrees. Uh, so it's usually track or runners that are typically going to have that. You know, hip osteoarthritis can be uh, usually in our older population, and labral tears are also going to probably be more in your younger population. Typically, on these patients, um, you're going to see a positive uh, a Faber or Fadir. So internal and external rotation with the hip at 90 degrees is, is where the patient's going to have pain. You can also have stinch fields, which is a positive hip flexion test. So the patient's kind of doing resisted hip flexion. It gets pain within the groin. It usually indicates that that is also um, uh, something inside the hip causing the pain. Uh, for this, since it's a deeper structure, we're going to use a curvilinear probe. So I'm not going to use a linear probe on this one. I need to see deeper to make sure that I can see my target. Um, I'm typically going to use a 22, three and a half inch gauge needle. And then when I do the injection, I'm going to use about four cc's of bupivacaine for the diagnostic portion of the injection, tell the patient they should feel good for about five or six hours that day. And then usually I want to use a particulate steroid if I'm using steroids. So I prefer Celestone. Uh, six milligrams, which is the equivalent of about 40 milligrams of Depomedrol. Um, uh, in, in, uh, um, as I was saying earlier, there's no blind technique for this injection, so do not try to perform a blind. The ultrasound here you'll see, here's the head of the patient up here to the right, the, the leg of the patient goes down here to the left. Once again, you're seeing, just like Dave saying, you got excellent hand control of the ultrasound. So this is gonna be where you have an oblique angle because your femur is gonna come up, the femoral neck is gonna branch off at about a 45 to 60 degree angle into the acetabulum. Um, you're just gonna be just lateral uh, to, the, to the groin. And looking at it from the, the head down to the feet, you can see that the angle. So the femur would be coming through here. And then at that 45 to 60 degree angle, it'd be going up into the acetabulum, the fem femoral neck. And there, once again, is looking at the bottom up. And I, I just want to highlight this, and this is actually a case, once again, just like Dr. Russo showed cases from this week. This is a case I did this week. I actually did this Monday morning on a patient who is um, uh, morbidly obese. I think their BMI had to be between 45 and 50. Um, so you're going to see this was uh, quite a struggle um, to not only one, see the patient's anatomy, proper anatomy, uh, but um, uh, really struggle to see a clinky needle and then follow it up by doing with using the MSK. And, and my angle is probably about 60, 70 degrees here. So it's a very steep angle. So I'd expect 
you know, they have a harder time seeing the quinky needle. Um, and but this, you'll see the solenoid MSK needle definitely was more visible. I just want to kind of give you an idea what the anatomy is going to look like. So your your labrum is going to be up here to the left. Your humeral head is going to be right through here, and the neck is going to be right along here. My needle is going to come up on the top right and come almost at that 60, 70 degree angle down and touch the femoral neck. So let's watch the, the shrinky one here. I'll actually turn off my, my commentary. So as you can see, I'm kind of scanning back and forth to try to visualize the, the, the neck as best I can. Boom, you can see here, I can see the femoral neck. I can see it scoop down and kind of go along. Um, I think I even get a better stopping that. that. And eventually what you're going to see is I'm going to use a lot of those techniques that Dr. Russo was talking about where I'm going to jiggle my needle to see it come, come down. Um, so right about now is where the needle is going to enter. You can see it come in right here. You can see the femoral head right there. You can see it come down onto the neck right there. I'm kind of scanning in. So there's head, femoral neck right here. You can see this needle come down. I'm kind of jiggling it. Um, I probably had to put this, inch, this needle in about three inches uh, to reach the target. And as you can see there, you rarely or, or never really saw much of, of the needle. It was all done by watching the tissue move. So exact same patient, exact same technique. Now you're going to see the pyunk needle. See how that needle almost lights up like a lightsaber at such a steep angle. You can see it go all the way down and in. Boom, We're all the way right there touched bone and injected. You can actually see how hyperarchoic it is and much easier it was to see on such a, an obese patient. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna bring Dave back on. We're gonna open it up to our Q&A. We've had two people um, from what I can see have, have sent in um, messages or uh, regarding that and I'll, I'm going to throw the first one out to Dr. Russo and, um, and 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 get his opinion on it. And then um, if I have a different opinion, I'll chime in. If not, I'll just tell you I agree. Usually, Dave and I agree on most things. Um, but we have a a, a, a Dr. Uh, Ch Choker. I hope I'm saying that right. And he says, "Can you kindly tell me if you're going to insert a catheter for an interscaling brachial plexus?" injection, do you do it in plane or out of plane using the ultrasound? Mm, that is, that, that's a great question. So I've actually, I've, I've actually done it both ways. And a lot of it depends on sort of the patient's um, anatomy and clinical circumstances. I've, I've seen some patients who've had some uh, kind of radiation type treatments to the kind of uh, upper quadrant and kind of neck shoulder area. And sometimes that's created some some issues. Uh, I, I really think it, it, it depends on the, um, the unique anatomy of, 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 of the patient. I've, I've done it both ways and find them to be, you know, equally satisfying. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Dave. I think every patient is different and you just got to go by what you can see um, using the ultrasound. If I had my choice, I would probably um, I, I kind of like out of plane in this. I usually like to put my, my transducer where I can see one, uh, scaling muscle on one end, the other on the other, and I can see the gap in between and come on the edge of the probe and go in between. Um, uh, but, you know, coming out of plane, it, you know, is a little trickier, you know, cause you got to make sure that needle tip stays under your ultrasound probe. So you don't lose, lose track of it, but that, that's the technique I prefer. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I would say that this is, I, I like this question because I think it also highlights a general principle that, that, that it's good to know at least two ways to do any injection. And um, when it comes to like these anatomical variants, I mean, you know, the, 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 the variability in especially, you know, vascular anatomy, I don't think we always, you know, appreciate how much variability there is. So, you know, sometimes you see things in places that you just don't expect them. So being able to sort of change your change your approach on the fly uh, and feel comfortable with that is is a great benefit to the patient. Yeah, I totally agree. There's, you should always know different ways to skin the cat because the cat's never going to be the same. Um, 
Yeah, we've got a we got another question here, and basically it's a, a, a physician, a Dr. Maria uh, Cristancho, uh, writing in. She she says that she regularly uses ultrasound for nerve blocks and joint injections, as well as some trigger point injections, and she really wants to be able to, to perform them faster, safer, and more reliable in her pain clinic, but. She also has to take into account um, insurance reimbursement. And so as terms of, you know, buying a hypoechoic versus a hyperechoic needle, you know, you know, how do you get around this to, or, or how can you justify, I guess, the cost for the, the better technology of needle? Um, and I can tell you, Dave and I talk about this stuff all the time since we both own and run our own clinics. Um, do you want to chime in on this one, Dave? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, I, I mean, I have, I, I have kind of two, I have kind of two, two thoughts. Like, you know, I mean, I totally get it. So, you know, and, um, but you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I would say if you're doing, you know, a trigger when, when I didn't use ultrasound, let me, let me frame it this way. When I didn't use ultrasound, probably the most frightening injection I did in my clinic was like a thoracic trigger point injection. <laughs> you know? um, so having the ultrasound adds such a huge layer of, of, of safety, especially if you're sort of, you know, injecting around the cervicothoracic junction. And, um, you know, what price is that? I mean, really, you know, it's, it's, it's patient safety. So I think, you know, maybe, you know, explaining to the patient, you know, the need for this kind of, you know, um, this kind of modality or this kind of needle in this kind of situation uh, goes a long way. Also, it depends what you're injecting. So I do a lot of regenerative medicine in my practice. So this is a non reinsure This is a, a non insurance service for the most part. And patients have a, a financial stake in the outcome. So I really need to be able, you know, to say with high credibility that, you know, I got my injectate exactly where it needs to go. So in, in, in that situation, you know, the cost is, is a little bit of a, a small, you know, in a, a small insurance premium on, 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 on the whole process. But I certainly understand that everyone's practice economics are, are, are different and um, it's, it's a constant juggle. Yeah, I, I, I think, first thing, I think Dave is exactly right. I mean, um, uh, one, I, I think you, you know, I, I've definitely I've gone to the billing and coding courses for pain management now for about two decades, um, so I almost know the billing and coding better than my um, uh, my biller and coders in my office. So first things first is one, if you're going to add ultrasound, is it inclusive to the procedure? Meaning you can't charge extra for it. Um, so you need to you need to know that. So if you look at your CPT codes. There's large joints uh, without um, uh, ultrasound, and then there's with ultrasound. The with ultrasound does reimburse a little bit more for taking the time to use it. And then there's other injections, you know, like the peripheral nerve injections or tendon injections, where ultrasound is not part of the code. And so that's a add-on code that you can get reimbursed for. So if you're gonna use ultrasound, you're gonna wanna make sure that you are actually um, adding it if necessary to get paid for the extra time using ultrasound uh, to do uh, the procedure. So make sure that you're not leaving money on the table by not including that, that, that CPT code for the use of ultrasound if you can add it. And then if you are doing a, like a large joint injection, make sure you're using the right code that includes the ultrasound when using it so you do get paid more to, to, to do it. Second thing is, is, yeah, so if you're, for me, um, you know, I've been doing these for 15 years and God, I, some weeks I can do up to a hundred injections and that's not just ultrasound, that's fluoroscopy and ultrasound. Um, and I find now that my ultrasound injections, I can get done in less than 30 seconds. Um, so now I can double book an ultrasound patient on top of a fluoroscopy. I can get multiple in, uh, throughout the day. And in my opinion, the, the faster I can do them, the more I can double book, the more patients I can see that day, the more I can sleep better at night knowing that I've treated, you know, all, I got my patients in efficiently. I know I did it safely. And I know that there's not, I'm not going to get phone calls later with some issue or a problem. And part of that process of being able to do these faster and safer 
is you know maybe spending a little extra money on a, on a needle that I can actually see what, that I've got the structure and give the patient the best chance uh, of a good outcome. So if you're struggling you know, with ultrasound to see your needle and making sure you got the target, and that adds on another five minutes to the procedure versus being able to, you know, doing it in 30 seconds, um, then the extra cost um, of that needle is going to be made up by the volume of how many more patients you're going to be able to see and treat during the day. Um, uh, we just got a comment that came in. It's not a question from James Nelson. He says, this has been very insightful. Thank you for the presentation. Well, James, I appreciate you tuning in today. Um, and uh, I, I think at this point, there's no more questions. Dave, is there any other last thoughts you want to add? Yeah, you know, I I guess I would just I guess I would just conclude with the. Uh, Oop, kind of lost you there, Dave. Yep. Conclu conclude with what? I guess I would just conclude with the with 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 the observation that um, you know when when injecting um, high value injectates, be it visco supplementation or you know autologous regenerative products or any concern about altered anatomy or um, you know, in doing a new injection in a in in an area of the body you're not used to treating, having that visibility is 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 key. It's key to building confidence, and it's key to ensuring that the patient has you know a safe experience and a good outcome. Perfect. Um, and I, I just got a couple other things that I'm going to go on through before I get my last slide. So um, feel free to reach out to uh, Payank. Uh, they'd be more than happy to get you. Uh, different educational posters or information on their product and needles and different techniques for during certain injections. And then last but not least, I want to just remind everybody that tonight was part one with my, my dear friend, Dr. Russo. Um, Dr. Rosenblum and myself are going to come back and we're going to do uh, popular um, peripheral nerve injections under ultrasound. I think specifically we're going to be doing, if I, if I can remember correctly, occipital, ileal, inguinal, and uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve blocks on uh, December 1st. We would love to have you all uh, come back and join us at that time. And uh, yeah, my, my last thoughts are, um, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, giving your patients the best outcome is, is always the thing you wanna do. Um, and to me, that's always making sure that I get the needle at the right structure when I see a patient come back and tell me they didn't improve um, and didn't even get relief the day of the injection, you know, if I did that injection blind or use suboptimal uh, equipment or technology, you know, I, I the first question I have in my head is one, did I did I did I miss and not hit the target? Is that why they didn't get better? Or two, um, uh, you know, I got to wonder if I have the wrong diagnosis. Um, and I, I never like to have that question in my head. And so always using image guidance with the best technology or needles available to me uh, to ensure I got that target. I never once have to question if I miss or had a bad day. Um, I just then know that, hey, diagnosis A that we thought it was is not it. Let's move on to diagnosis B and, 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 and the appropriate procedure to treat that. So thanks again, everybody for reaching for coming in tonight. Uh, we'll be mindful of your time. It's uh, 5 p.m. and we will say good night. Thank you.